Tonight, celebrations and sorrow in Afghanistan. <laughs> the reality of life under Taliban rule a year after the takeover. The dreams are everyday dead. What those who fled here want the world to know. Complaints that home developers are changing the price after contracts are signed. We had a binding contract at that price. So just build our house at what it was supposed to be built at. Good job. And a world first to help a Canadian child with an extraordinarily rare disease. Our therapy proved that you can try to do something better for your child. How it could help kids around the world. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, Afghanistan is marking a year under Taliban rule. And while the repressive regime celebrates in the streets of Kabul, millions of ordinary Afghans are struggling to put food in their mouths. One year ago, as Afghans tried to flee, those scenes of chaos and desperation unfolded. But for those left behind, that chaos has now given way to a dark reality. Many are hiding in fear, feeling abandoned by countries like Canada that promised to help them. Women and girls stripped of their basic rights, like education, the country now in the grips of a humanitarian crisis. Evan Dyer begins our coverage tonight with the broken promises of a violent regime and the calls to get humanitarian aid flowing into the country again. On the streets of Kabul today, the Taliban celebrated their first year back in power. Their return has ended the war, but instead brought famine. 20 million people face acute hunger, including millions of children. Mothers struggling to feed their babies, filling wards like this one at Kabul's Indira Gandhi Hospital. The Taliban wants the world to lift sanctions imposed on the group 20 years ago. A coalition of Canadian aid agencies also want exemptions to Canada's sanctions and anti-terrorism laws so that aid can start to flow again, something the US and UK have done already. In Canada, we haven't taken this step yet a year later. And so that's fundamentally what we're asking for. But the Taliban haven't made things easier by breaking all the main promises they made a year ago when they negotiated the US withdrawal. First, they promised there would be no revenge against those who'd opposed them. Instead, revenge killings have been common. Women would be afforded all their rights. Second, they said girls could continue to attend school. That promise was just as empty. Do, do not accept. Taiba Adimadi escaped to Edmonton earlier here. this year, but and stayed I in touch with friends time. back in like Kabul who've all been told to stay home. They are saying that we are afraid of Taliban, we cannot go out, and we are just staying, and the, the, the dreams are every day dead. The Taliban's third promise was that they would never again play host to groups like Al-Qaeda. As for that promise... On Saturday, at my direction, the United States successfully concluded an airstrike in Kabul, Afghanistan, that killed the emir of Al-Qaeda. It turned out two weeks ago that al-Qaeda's new leader, Ayman al-Zawahiri, just like the old one, Osama bin Laden, had been living as a guest of the Taliban. The new Taliban have turned out to be just as duplicitous, misogynistic and oppressive as the old Taliban. And so the world faces tough choices on how to deal with them, whether to deal with them, as hunger grows deeper and another winter approaches. And then, Evan, you think about, you know, all those people, the, the, particularly the 40,000 Canada has promised to resettle here. Yeah. Well, Adrian, over the past year, we've seen just over 17,000 refugees actually reach Canada. Some of them still face hurdles, actually, in Canada, including Taiba, who we heard from in this story, people who are still waiting for the documents that would allow them to work, to study, and resume their lives. And the government says there's another 8,000 people still in Afghanistan who are at least partway through the process of being accepted to Canada. In many of those cases, the government says the main impediment is that they have no way to get out of Afghanistan. But we continue to hear stories from applicants who say they're also experiencing problems getting answers from Canada. What a mess. Evan Dyer in Ottawa, thank you. Thanks, Adrian. We have more on the story coming up. Freshta Karimi fled Afghanistan last fall when she realized her life was in danger. 
Now with her family in Canada, some thoughts on how to help those left behind. There is a major milestone in the fight against COVID-19 tonight. The UK has become the first country in the world to approve a vaccine that targets two strains of the virus, the original strain and the Omicron variant. Lauren Pelly shows us what this changes. UK residents could soon have a new tool to fight COVID-19, Moderna's newly authorized bivalent vaccine. The shot targets both the original virus plus the Omicron BA1 variant that was first detected late last year. That's in the same family as the virus circulating right now. It provides a better immune response than the original vaccine. It works a bit more like a tailored annual flu shot, but there are questions on exactly how effective it would be in the real world. We don't know whether that translates into what we call clinical efficacy, preventing infection, preventing hospitalization. It's also not clear how many people will be keen to get another shot. In Ontario, one of the province's tracking booster shots, uptake is dwindling. Close to 90% of the eligible population had their primary series. Roughly half got a first booster and a little over 40% have gone for a second. On the streets of Toronto, views on adding a bivalent booster were mixed. If there's a specific variant that was targeted, I would consider a fourth. I've been waiting for it because I know that the previous vaccine only is for the earlier versions. Yeah, I might not get it. We need, like, every time a new vaccine comes, we need to look at the stats. Antibodies, Virologist Angela Rasmussen says the bivalent shot will be worth getting, regardless of someone's age or how many times they've caught COVID. But without question, it's also going to be really important for the people who are vulnerable and more high risk to get this vaccine, whether they've had Omicron or not. And there's a society-wide benefit too. The more people that get vaccines and increase uh, effective population immunity, the less the virus will have the opportunity to circulate in the population, and that helps everybody. So I'm imagining people at home saying, interesting, but when do we get it? Well, today Moderna told us that the shot is still under review with Health Canada. If it does get approved, the company said it's ready to work with local officials to get it out as soon as possible. In the meantime, if you're keen to get a fourth dose, you can. It's an older vaccine tailored to an older strain of the virus, but we know they're still holding up really well against what matters most, preventing serious illness and death. So it still does its job. Exactly. All right, Lauren Pelly, thank you as always. Bell Media has ended its contract with CTV National News anchor Lisa Leflam. The veteran journalist announced the news in a video today on her Twitter account. On June 29th, I was informed that Bell Media made a, quote, business decision to end my contract, bringing to a sudden close my long career with CTV News. I was blindsided and am still shocked and saddened by Bell Media's decision. La Flamme says while she was informed of the decision at the end of June, she was also asked not to disclose it to anyone, including her colleagues. In a statement, Bell Media said recognizing changing viewer habits, CTV made the business decision to move its chief news anchor in a different direction. La Flamme's career with CTV News spanned more than three decades, taking over as senior editor and chief news anchor in 2011. While it is crushing to be leaving CTV National News in a manner that is not my choice, please know reporting to you has truly been the greatest honor of my life, and I thank you for always being there. In a separate announcement, Bell Media named Omar Sachedina as La Flamme's replacement. He starts in the role on September the 5th. Now we have new data tonight for anyone looking to buy or sell a home. The slowdown of Canada's housing market is continuing, with home sales falling for the fifth straight month. According to the Canadian Real Estate Association, sales in July were down 29% from July last year, and the average price was down 5% compared to last July. Tonight, Nisha Patel looks at which markets are seeing the biggest declines and what is expected in the months ahead. These are the signs of a housing slowdown. Homes take longer to sell. Buyers hesitate over a changing market. It seems like prices are coming down slower than rates are rising, which doesn't make me feel as optimistic. 
Marshall Smith couldn't afford to buy in Vancouver, so he moved to BC's Kootenai region last year and is still feeling stretched. We're really pushing our budget and we're essentially agreeing to live paycheck to paycheck. Canadians are paying more to borrow money as interest rates rise. So even in a cooling market, buyers may not have more purchasing power. But prices are falling, now seeing the biggest declines in years. It is a fairly well-advanced uh, correction. It's not entirely done, in our view, because the Bank of Canada will continue to proceed by, uh, with hiking rates further uh, between now and October. Since the peak in February, some markets have tumbled much more than others. Average prices in Kitchener-Waterloo dropped 20 percent. Toronto slid 15 percent. Winnipeg fell 5 percent. Chilliwack, B.C. slipped 9 percent. And Vancouver dipped 6 percent. We have to be mindful of the starting point, uh, which was you know, very, very lofty prices and significant appreciation uh, during the pandemic. The suburbs of Ontario and B.C. are expected to bear the brunt of this correction. But markets in Alberta and Saskatchewan may be more resilient since they weren't as frenzied the past few years. I think we're going to see probably stability. I don't think the market's going to take off. I don't think the market's going to go down hugely. This Calgary realtor says he's had many clients move to the city for affordability. Buying a house for $500,000 when something similar would cost double in Toronto or Vancouver. We had people come out here. Almost every second or third buyer was an out-of-town buyer. In this market, moving to another city may not save you much. Buyers may find a better break in another province. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. With housing so expensive to buy, renting is the only option for many Canadians, but renters are being hit with big price hikes. Rentals.ca says the average rent for all the properties listed there, that's from basement apartments to detached homes, was more than $1,900 in July. That is nearly 3% higher than it was the previous month and 10% higher than the previous year. Several B.C. and Ontario cities top the list for being most expensive, with the average two-bedroom unit now costing up to $3,600 a month. As Belle Puri shows us, that has left some would-be renters struggling to find what they need. So this would be an example of how we've made our space work for us. Uh, Creativity is how Erin Hobson and her husband make the most of their small bedroom. space. This is our bedroom, and this is our canoe, and it hangs above our bed. Amid record high prices and few options, they've been searching for a bigger place in Ottawa since December 2020. We've actually also been outbid in the rental market. The uh, rental company or the landlord comes back and says to you, well, I've actually been, um, I've been offered $2,100 for this $1,800 apartment and I'm going to accept that offer. Ottawa's average two-bedroom monthly rent hit that $2,100 mark for the first time this spring, and the number of available units is half of what it was last summer. Housing experts say rents are high across the country, primarily due to life getting back to normal after the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Right now, there's definitely very high demand for rentals. We are in a very busy rental market. I also think that we have a lot of people that are just moving back into the city in general. Because we actually have three years of students coming back at the same time, if you think about it, because there's a lot of students who started school for the first two years from home. Shelby Sender plans to move from Edmonton next month to attend UBC in Vancouver, the most expensive rental market in the country. There was one rental listing I talked to a landlord and it was $900, not including some utilities, just to share a bedroom in a basement with someone else. And there would be four people in the basement, plus two upstairs tenants would use the kitchen. Vancouver has seen some of the highest year-over-year -year increases with the price of the average two-bedroom up 19%. I strongly thought about living in my car as an option. Not much is expected to change until perhaps fall, when experts say rents may stabilize after those looking for a place now have hopefully found one. Belle Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. Jason Kenney will only be Alberta's premier for a few more months, but today he had something to say about the political battle for his job, attacking the platform of a leading candidate, warning that her plan would make the province a, quote, laughingstock. Aaron Collins has the story. Alberta's outgoing premier wading into the race for his successor, Jason Kenney panning the idea of an Alberta Sovereignty Act. One of the country's leading conservative constitutional experts uh, has characterized this as the Alberta Suicide Act. 
the Sovereignty Act, a key piece of perceived frontrunner Danielle Smith's platform for the UCP leadership. It would essentially allow Alberta's government to ignore any federal law it disagreed with, something Kenny says many experts believe would be unconstitutional. And Howard England says that uh, the ideas included in the Sovereignty Act are, quotes, to use a technical term from constitutional law, nuttier than a squirrel turd. But in a statement, Smith pushed back, saying the Premier and other experts should reserve their opinion on this legislation until they can actually read it first. Smith hopes to appeal to Albertans angry over everything from COVID restrictions to the federal carbon tax. Simply put, we need less Ottawa in our lives. And the number one issue I'm hearing from Albertans is, who's going to stand up for us when Ottawa is treating us so unfairly? Alberta politicians attacking Ottawa is nothing new, but Smith's Sovereignty Act goes further than some Conservatives are comfortable with, leaving Alberta's United Conservatives anything but. A Danielle Smith victory today means a Rachel Notley victory tomorrow. Daniel Smith has accused the Premier of meddling in the UCP's packed leadership race. The Premier says he isn't taking sides. And some political watchers say even if he was, it might not help. There's so much animosity within the party, especially the most active members of the party against Jason Kenney. Does his comments against Smith actually backfire and help her? If Danielle Smith wins the UCP leadership and becomes Premier, she says she might want to make the Alberta Sovereignty Act law by the fall. The question for Conservatives is what that might mean for the party's fate in the next provincial election in the spring. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. We're keeping an eye on a serious international development tonight. China is retaliating after another visit by U.S. lawmakers to Taiwan. Sasha Petrosik explains the mounting tension between Washington and Beijing. China's guns exploded with anger once again near Taiwan. More war games after another U.S. congressional delegation landed in Taipei. These politicians are colluding with the separatist forces and encouraging them, says an official Chinese spokesman. Beijing's communist leadership claims the democratic island as its own and threatens to unify Taiwan with the mainland by force. Washington has long acknowledged China's claim, though it supplies Taiwan's military with weapons and keeps close economic ties. The Democratic and Republican members of Congress met with Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen. We have a moral obligation to do everything we can to prevent an unnecessary conflict. And Taiwan has demonstrated incredible restraint and discretion during challenging times. Threatening times when it's vital to show U.S. friendship, Tsai said. The U.S. administration has gone out of its way to reassure Beijing that Washington's China policy has not changed. This despite an even higher level visit to Taiwan by House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi two weeks ago. It set off six days of Chinese military drills that encircled the island. Experts worry that both the U.S. and China are now locked into a new pattern of provocations. And China's going to have to then continue to jump up that ladder of escalation beyond what it's already done and find new things in its toolkit to show its discontent. And that's where the danger lies, is what happens next? It's especially unpredictable since that next includes U.S. plans to send its warships through the passage between Taiwan and mainland China in the coming weeks. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Washington. In India tonight, lots of celebrations marking 75 years since independence. And as Salima Shibji shows us, this means a big push for patriotism. The sea of saffron white and green is endless, flags everywhere. Matched with patriotic spirit, a fervor to celebrate India's 75th birthday, and all that's come since it shed British colonial rule. On this historic day, when India takes her place... And became its own country, amid a bitter and bloody partition, when the subcontinent was split along religious lines into India and Pakistan. 
That country celebrated its Independence Day on Sunday with a cordial exchange along the border, a gift of sweets from Pakistan's military to India's. The intertwined countries, neighbors first, but also sworn enemies. At this New Delhi stadium, there's immense pride in India's accomplishments, felt keenly among the young. We have done a lot of hard work and we are also doing a lot of struggles and everything to make our India number one. I very proud feeling that I live in India. And the older generation. Like it is a proud moment for us. I've seen so much of progress, scientific, agriculture, education. Pride in progress was the thread underlying the official ceremony to mark 75 years. But India's Prime Minister also emphasized there's more effort to come. Narendra Modi wants to see India become a developed nation in the next 25 years. We need to work towards it with all that we have, he says. Plans for the future, but the government is also concentrated on the present. For weeks, officials have been pushing for more overt displays of patriotism, with an aggressive campaign to have the flag flown in every Indian household. Companies making the tricolor even got a break, able to count these flags towards their required social responsibility quota. It's a campaign with a clear objective, promoting a massive show of pride in the country, a display of unity to mark 75 years. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Delhi. There is the hint of new hope for a young boy battling an extremely rare disease. By replacing that gene, are you fixing the root of the problem? Yes, exactly. Coming up, a revolutionary gene therapy that could save lives in the future. The Republican who took on Donald Trump faces stiff competition for her job. Can I get your honest reaction when I say the name Liz Cheney? Traitor. We head to Wyoming for some contentious primaries. And an Ontario developer is demanding $175,000 more from buyers who are still waiting for their homes to be built. I felt they wanted me to sign one of these pieces of paper so that they could either resell my home or make more money on it. We're back in two. When Taliban fighters seized Kabul one year ago today, among the first devastating losses were the rights of women. Freshta Karimi, an activist for women's rights in Afghanistan, was able to flee the country last fall with her family. She's now in Canada, so we sat down today to talk about what and who she left behind. When you think about your country and you think about who you left behind, because you work so hard for women's rights, I know you stay in touch. How, how are the women you left behind? Leaving them back uh, in Afghanistan was the worst experience. Every time when I think of it, when I speak about it, it makes me so emotional, it makes me cry. Uh, so their life is, uh, you know, very difficult right now in Afghanistan. They, uh, you know, what we were working for day and night, uh, for all those achievements, we lost them. Now they don't have their, even their basic uh, uh, human rights, which is education, which is uh, access to, uh, you know, like some of the health services even, like uh, going to school, going to work, all those things they lost. Uh, we were uh, doing our masters uh, together in, so, in law and, in law and criminology so when i speak to them they are hopeless and they are uh, we were about to submit our thesis and uh, that uh, then the country was taken over by taliban and then we couldn't continue in and Afghanistan. in in terms of what the streets look like from your friends who are still there if you were to be dropped into kabul right yeah. now what would it look like I know people they were, that they had a very good lifestyle, they had a very good business, but now they have uh, economic problems, they have financial problems. They cannot even run their daily life because everything has stopped. They are talking that everything has changed for everyone, and especially for women because we have to wear these long dresses, otherwise we are not allowed inside the universities. And there are even there's a ruling now that by the Taliban that the families, the male families has to control the dressing of the females. Mm. Otherwise, they will be charged and they will be put in prison. 
So if you ask if, if a male family member is, will be charged for it and will be put in prison, of course they will you know, force their uh, female uh, family members to wear a burqa or a wear a uh, This hijab. sounds worse than it was of course. 25 years yeah. ago. They know what to do now. They know how to uh, cheat. They know how to, you know, lie to the international community because they now say, no, things has changed. Security is very good for everyone. Uh, we are considering women's rights. Women's rights and human rights is much better than the past 20 years. It was all a lie. So, yeah, like, they're very good now on the media. They know how to use mm -hmm. the media, how to use the social media, how to, you know, like, it's uh, somehow uh, uh, trick, uh, you know, they know the tricks right now. What, what would you like to see happen? Yeah. So wha what we are expecting, the international communities, that they have to speak and talk to the Taliban and they have to bring pressure on them. They have to, why, like in the past, they were having face-to-face -face discussions. Why not now? But if Canada has declared the Taliban a, a, no, considers a terrorist organization, it's not going to have face-to-face -face conversations. With they have to continue their consultations with the uh, Afghan people to find a solution what could be the best thing for Afghanistan? Either speaking to them face to face or either, you know, to do the same as they did in 2001, go back and fight against them. So, so either fight or, or Canada has to figure out a way to talk to the Taliban. Yeah. If Canada thinks, if uh, all other international community thinks that Taliban is still a terrorist group, then yes, why don't they, do, they fight against them? And for you personally, your two little ones, your husband, your mother-in-law, how, how is life? I, I, loved, I loved my country so much and I still love it. But uh, I'm lucky that I could uh, get out with my family, that we are safe. And we uh, end up in a very beautiful country with beautiful people here. Uh, it's a safe place for us. Well, we're all better for your efforts. Thank you, Freshta. Thank you so much. Thank you. Kreshta also says she feels very lucky to have a job and that her family, including her two young children, uh, are all settling down. Her husband was a lawyer back home. He is here now studying to improve his English in order to restart his career. Now, after the break, a new medical procedure could change the life of a little boy with a rare disease. It's literally an injection that changes his life. But could it help those with more common illnesses? Some think yes. We'll tell you how next. Hope is growing tonight for the future of a little boy in Toronto at the center of a great big medical effort. Now, two years ago, he was diagnosed with an incredibly rare disease, one for which there was no known cure. But as Ioana Romiliotis shows us, the extraordinary efforts of his parents, his community, and dozens of scientists could be changing that. And Michael is walking. Four-year-old Michael Pirovalakis is finally stepping into a brighter future. Is it almost there? Michael almost is the only there. child in Canada diagnosed with SPG50. Ready? Here we go. An ultra-rare neurodegenerative Push. disease that leads Push. to paralysis. Push. Nice. Good job. He's also now the only child in the world to be given a potential cure. And boom! So I was super nervous because, you know, gene therapy isn't 100% safe in itself, right? And I was, all I could think about was, are we doing the right thing? It was, it was just really kind of like... The next color in the rainbow. Unbelievable. Unbelievable why? It was such a hard journey to get there. That day, this past March, was a remarkable milestone. Michael's condition is caused by a mutated or missing gene. In a clinical trial designed just for Michael, doctors at Toronto's Hospital for Sick Children injected a normal version of the gene into his spinal fluid. It traveled to his brain to generate the protein essential for healthy brain development. And we actually were able to accomplish this thing that no one really had done before. Dr. Jim Dowling is leading the clinical trial. Uh, with the mutation, the gene doesn't make the protein it's supposed to make. So in theory, by replacing that gene, are you fixing the root of the problem? Yes, exactly. And that's what makes it such a powerful therapy. In this case, we're fixing the, the fundamental problem. We're replacing the, the missing part. 
The expectation is it will stop the progression of Michael's disease, maybe even reverse some degeneration. Uh, obviously the hope is that it will reverse some of the problems that already have been presented uh, and enable him to gain functions he didn't have before. How that day came to be is an extraordinary story of love and hope. Michael's condition is so rare, only 80 children worldwide share the same diagnosis. There was no treatment and no financial incentive for pharmaceutical companies to create one. So Terry and Georgia Pirovalakis had to find a way to do it themselves. They raised more than $3 million to finance an experimental treatment for their son. With the help of scientists around the world, a therapy was developed and successfully tested in animal models before it was given to Michael. It's a crazy, surreal experience. You expect like all this, you know, major thing, but it's literally an injection that changes his life. You Hopefully. Know, a, you know, <laughs> Hopefully. A simple injection that goes up his spine that took three years to make and hundred scientists. Now and now it's waiting. Now we just wait and hope and um, just watch him flourish. Hey, okay? Baby steps. The hospital will monitor Michael's progress for five years. And while Michael's therapy was designed specifically for his unique condition. It will be different for different children. Dr. David Malkin says it helps set the groundwork for more customized treatments. So while Michael's story is a very rare genetic disorder, this principle can be applied to thousands of children with rare genetic disease, but also to children with cancer, to children with heart disease, to children with asthma, to children with diabetes, common diseases. And in the context of Michael, um, we don't know what's in store for him with this particular therapy, uh, but as a physician, this gives me hope that, uh, that the future is brighter. As a scientist who works with many to try to make discoveries in the lab. This is the holy grail. As for Michael, it could take several months to see the full impact of the therapy. But his parents say the stiffness in his legs seems to be softening. Oh, no. And he's more engaged with toys, suggesting his cognition is improving too. No, you do it. Mm. Nice work. If he's able to use his wheelchair and say a few words and vocalize that he's in pain or he's hungry or he needs to go to the bathroom, those would be huge wins for us and, and for his future, right? More than anything, I pray that he becomes normal. But we, don't, we just, but we don't know, we don't know. <laughs> there are no guarantees and there are no regrets. We as parents did everything we could in our power to give him the best chance at whatever life he is going to live. And so many people say to us, like, you've given us hope. The, the darkness isn't as dark as we thought. Hey, sir. <laughs> Here we come. Here we come. Are we going to What do more is ahead for Michael may not be clear yet, but he's closer to it than he's ever been. Nice. Good job. Joanna Rumiliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Perfect. Terry and Georgia say they plan to keep raising money to help pay for a larger clinical trial in the U.S. this fall. That could allow more children like Michael to benefit from the same therapy. Next, on The National, she's one of the few Republicans who voted to impeach Donald Trump. Now she may lose her job over it. She will not get reelected. There's too many people that are pissed. We head to Wyoming, where Liz Cheney fights for her political career. Tomorrow night, one of the most powerful women in Washington could lose her job. Liz Cheney is a top Republican lawmaker and the daughter of a vice president. But it might not be enough to win Wyoming's Republican primary, where many of her former supporters now think she's the enemy. Katie Simpson is in Wyoming tonight. Thank you, man. Face me. Young ranchers and their parents prepare all year for this moment. <laughs> Adrenaline rushing, prized animals are paraded before the crowd. Yep. Yep. 
There is a giddy excitement in the barn, and it's about far more than just the energy of the state's largest fair. Tuesday's Republican primary vote has some downright gleeful over the prospect of Congresswoman Liz Cheney losing her job. She's missing the boat, and she will not get reelected. There's too many people that are pissed. You got a big smile on your face as you say that. I'm happy <laughs> that she will not be reelected. Can I get your honest reaction when I say the name Liz Cheney? Traitor. Traitor to the people of Wyoming. She hasn't been here for all she cares about is January 6th. Cheney is largely seen as an enemy for voting to impeach former President Donald Trump and for serving as co-chair of the Congressional Committee investigating the Capitol attack. Donald Trump made a purposeful choice to violate his oath of office, to ignore the ongoing violence against law enforcement, to threaten our constitutional order. There is no way to excuse that behavior. It was indefensible. Not even her deeply conservative credentials seem to be able to save her. She's staunchly pro-gun rights and anti-abortion. She also voted with the former president's policies more than 90% of the time. Harriet, please come on. Cheney is trailing badly in the polls to Harriet Hageman, a former critic of Trump, who ran an intensely local hard-right campaign, fully endorsed by Trump. Wyoming is the heart of Trump country. He beat President Biden by 43 points in the 2020 election. And everywhere you look, there are signs of it. Meet Trump, the 1,100-pound steer who was named in the former president's honor. The bull, Trump's lie that the election was stolen, has been embraced here. Volunteers canvassing for Cheney have been hearing all about it. Hi, how are you? Uh, hello. I'm Heath. Heath Mayo leads a small team of door knockers, mostly from out of state. I think she's taken some some courageous stands. I know she's been she's taken some hits. That's what it does. That's you know it's if you're not taking hits in Washington, you're probably not you're probably not taking a stand. Dave won't say who he's supporting in the primary, but he questions the value of the January 6th commission. Their doorstep conversation is a window into the grassroots Cheney versus Trump standoff. So if you knew the Capitol had been breached and then, like, and you were the president, and you didn't call any of the guards. If I was the president, guards. that shit wouldn't have happened. <laughs> well, that's it. There you go. <laughs> well, there you go. I think that's one part of it, but, like, for him to have, I, for me, I think that was the big part, was, like, he well, didn't, he didn't do, do anything for to, four hours right. to if stop it. he didn't it. do nothing, right. But like, that's not good. How do you and know I think he didn't he, do I, nothing? What if, he, what if he did say to do something, but he didn't know what to do? Well, I think the is there a format? Is there a format to tell him what to do? After eight hours of conversations like this one, Mayo is exhausted. He expects Cheney to be defeated, but is proud to be a part of her team. It's important to, to stand for what you believe, even when it's maybe not popular or maybe not, maybe, the, maybe a base of people, maybe that's not what they want to hear, but maybe it's something they need to hear. It is a lonely political path to be prepared to lose for standing by one's principles. Cheney nearly lost her relationship with her younger sister over a principle, accused of betraying Mary Cheney by announcing her opposition to same-sex marriage when she unsuccessfully tried to unseat a Republican senator in 2013. I do believe it's an issue that's got to be left up to the states. I do believe in the traditional definition of marriage. Mary is a lesbian, married to a woman, and their father, former Vice President Dick Cheney, had supported marriage equality. Eight years later, she made the kind of admission politicians so rarely make on principle. I was wrong. Uh, I love my sister very much. Uh, I uh, yeah, love uh, her family very much. Uh, and, uh, and, and I was wrong. Those who've known the Cheney family for decades are not surprised to see her stand up to Trump. How would you describe Liz Cheney as a candidate? Courageous, competent, um, Unafraid. As I said, Mike Sullivan is the former governor of Wyoming. He's a Democrat who switched parties to vote for Cheney in the primary. And when the job becomes more important than the values, then I think that's we're in a dangerous place in politics. She'll have no regrets for having taken the position that she had, I would believe, because she's, she's on a pathway that says what I'm doing is what I believe is right and what is in the best interests of our country. He too is expecting Cheney to lose and longs for the days when political rivals could be civil to one another. Little is civil about this Republican contest that is finally coming to an end. Liz Cheney is all but guaranteed to be left alone in Wyoming's political wilderness. 
She'll have to look beyond the harsh terrain of her home if she chooses to keep fighting this battle. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Jackson, Wyoming. And Katie will bring us a lot more coverage on that fascinating Republican primary tomorrow from Wyoming. Next, some Ontario home buyers are calling on the government to stop developers from demanding more money after a sale. We had a binding contract at that price. So just build our house at what it was supposed to be built at. Why some say what the government has already done is not enough. We want to tell you about an important recall tonight for baby swings. Now, it involves the four moms brands, specifically the Mama Roo baby swings and the Rockaroo rocker. It seems that any models with a three-point harness pose a strangulation risk. A baby did die in the U.S. 70,000 of, 70, of those units were sold in Canada, but no injuries have been reported here. For more information, check out recalls.canada. Now, some home buyers at a new Ontario housing development are really crying foul tonight, saying they're being asked to pay more than $100,000 over what they agreed to to get their homes built. Ryan Patrick Jones has the story. We paid extra to have a separate entrance put in. My mom's planning on living in the basement. When they put down their deposit three years ago, Jennifer Lefebvre and her family had big plans for their new $600,000 home in Stainer, 90 minutes north of Toronto. First, construction was delayed during the pandemic. Now the developer wants them to pay an extra $175,000. I was just upset. I felt they wanted me to sign one of these pieces of paper so that they could either resell my home or make more money on it. CBC News spoke with multiple buyers who say the developer gave them the same ultimatum. Pay more or take back your deposit and give up your home. We had a binding contract at that price. So just build our house at what it was supposed to be built at. The developer, Briarwood Development Group, blames supply chain issues and rising costs for labor and material, adding it's working with buyers to find a way forward. Earlier this year, Ontario brought in new rules to address developers trying to raise prices on pre-sold homes or cancel purchase agreements. We are not going to tolerate these types of bad faith, uh, unethical practices. After CBC News revealed another developer cancelled dozens of contracts unless buyers paid more, the province announced companies could face a fine of up to $100,000 or a two-year license suspension. This real estate lawyer says the government could do more. It would be very easy for the government to say, you can't cancel projects, you can't add this kind of money to a purchase agreement. If you do, you're going to have to compensate the buyers. Premier Doug Ford maintains his government is protecting consumers. We're going to make sure that uh, they aren't allowed to uh, go there and pull the carpet out from underneath them. The provincial regulator says it's looking into this latest situation, but wouldn't comment on specifics. Ryan Patrick Jones, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back from backyards to the big leagues, Everybody plays in their backyard, and it's, it's, it's becoming a, a big thing. How to become a pro cornhole player. Not kidding. Next. You are watching the high-stakes game of cornhole, and that guy hucking the bags, that's Newfoundland's first pro player. Dion Cousy recently went to compete in a tournament hosted by the American Cornhole League. That is a real thing. He ended up winning his way to a pro contract. His skill in this game is our moment. Bag down, draw back, and get the hoy. Dion, we gotta back up here. How the heck do you become a professional cornhole player? Like, how did that happen? It's amazing, actually. We had noticed that there's a Canadian Open that was happening. Uh, we thought it would be a great idea to have a bunch of people from the league go up there and, and have fun with it. And uh, we done that, and it just snowballed to the point whereby Whoa! felt as if I got lucky, I got into a routine, I uh, 
can't explain it really, what, how it all happened. And when it was all said and done, they made an announcement that I was the last Canadian standing. And with that became a professional contract. I had no idea that this was even available. Oh, it was really remarkable what had happened. Everybody plays in their backyard and it's, it's, it's becoming a, a big thing. It, the sport has grown like you wouldn't believe. There you go. The competition here in Newfoundland, I have to say, it's, it's, it's tough. Okay, this is, this is amazing. Uh, 27 feet, I know it's not metric, but 27 feet from where your feet are to where the hole is. I guess it's three points to get it, get the bag in the hole, one point for the perimeter. I'm glad he said he didn't know you could be a pro. I didn't know either. Looks like fun. That is a national for August the 15th. Good night.